Welcome to Square Reading Podcast, episode 12. Okay, today we are going to be doing gimmicks. Ones that worked, ones that didn't, ones that we think were good, ones that are not, and everything in between. So, <laughs> welcome. Welcome back to those who already listen or watch. And uh, how you guys doing? I'm good. Uh, yeah, not bad. We're just ramping up Little League wrestling season, and we're going to close this in about three weeks and get a little bit more to the SICW training gym and really ramp up that, too. And hopefully you'll be able to hang your son's medal for taking state on your belt. <laughs> I'm hoping so. <laughs> it's, it's tough to even qualify, though. I'll give it to anybody that even qualifies. Give props to anybody who qualifies. Well, I'm just coming off of uh, last night. Uh, you know, we're down at the training facility uh, and uh, teaching and coaching. And uh, pull, uh, gave the, the rookie some new moves to learn. And uh, um, I always do this thing where we do um, like a man in the middle. Uh, it's a scenario that... Uh, Tom Pritchard does at his training school, and uh, he posted, well, him and Seamus kind of posted a, a video together, and uh, I took some of uh, some of his man in the middle and uh, brought it to ours and was teaching the kids. Uh, they've been doing it for probably the last three weeks because there's like seven sets, uh, seven segments, I would say, mm -hmm. but it's one whole match. And each segment has probably 10 to 15 moves. Um, and it's normally set up where he has it set up where, uh, like, one person does it with, like, five people. Well, we we took it uh, a different way. We have it set up to where, uh, like, two people start it. And uh, they'll do, like, three of the segments together uh, where... Uh, one person will do all three segments to that guy, and then he turns around and finds a way to do all three segments that, with him. And then one of them leaves, and then another guy comes in, and then he does all three segments, and then that guy does all three segments back, and then he leaves, and another guy comes in. So I've been doing that probably the last probably the last three weeks. and uh, But along with that, because it teaches them um, – a lot of people, when they start learning to train wrestling, professional wrestling, uh, a lot of people can nail the moves, uh, but what they have problems with, and some people in like regular fights have problems with, is after you do something, what else can I do? You know, and in in anyone's professional's head, whether it be a boxer or a UFC uh, guy or a professional wrestler. We you teach that have, amateur wrestling too. We call it stringing it together or chaining it together. Right. So like you, you want to have you want to be and then the shot and then break down and just boom, 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 boom. Right. And I, I teach them to have like three moves in the back of their head that they can go to. So after they do one, see, like if uh, you're working on a guy's arm, um, you want to you know be doing the move that you're doing. But you also want to have like three other possibilities in the back of your head to go to, you know, um, and that's kind of what uh, this brings to the table. And not only does it bring it to the table, it makes you memorize it. And then you got to perform it with a guy who doesn't know it. So you're basically teaching the other guy. And then that guy is teaching the next one. Uh, but even after all that, then I always bring new moves to the table, too. So, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, three, maybe four different moves. Just something that they can add into their arsenal. Um, like last week, um, you know, I always have these, like, blocks uh, where, you know, I'd be stuck on, like, black and white wrestling. And, uh, you know, color, you know, TV, nothing racist, black and white wrestling. Uh, and then I'll move on to, like, uh, luchador-style wrestling. Uh, you know, uh, and then sometimes Japan, 
Well, last week, I was more into the Luchador stuff, so I was, like, watching everything Luchador. And so I was making mental notes about which moves I can bring to the students. And um, I hope you're you know, demonstrating night, some Phoenix moves. <laughs> right, right. No, no. Uh, so last night, um, I was actually watching old school. Uh, well, I was like last, till in the last week, earlier this week, I was watching a lot of Memphis stuff. And. I was watching a lot of uh, Jake the Snake and then his brother, Sam Houston. And uh, so I was watching, uh, you know, I'm a YouTube fan, you know. I'm starting to get back into the WWE Network and watching the new stuff. But I'm still addicted to being able to get on a laptop or a cell phone and, and pull up YouTube and pull up whatever I want to watch. So I was watching Sam Houston, and uh, he actually has a little bit, well, it's, it's kind of bizarre, but he has a training video from back when he was, uh, you know, a star. Uh, not that anything's different now, but uh, now it's a little sketchy because uh, halfway through the training video, the audio goes away and um, then it picks up and you can tell the audio doesn't match up to what uh, what's on the screen. But I didn't need the audio. All I can, all I needed was him showing how to do the move and how to get into it and get out of it. And uh, so there's a, a couple of cool moves that I was able to pull from it and then give to the students last night. But at the end, you know, say like we got 30 more minutes before we call it quits, I let them have like a tag match. Or depending on how many students there are, there might be, you know, a six-man tag team. Uh, so last night, there was a tag match because towards the end, we only had uh, four students. And uh, it was kind of cool because one of the students out of nowhere pulls the move that I train uh, that I showed them last week, which was a luchador style. It was, um, you know, if you're in a headlock, it's another way to reverse your headlock. Um, <laughs> it's kind of weird. You, you reverse your headlock by fighting and sliding underneath the guy's arms and you end up giving them a headlock but um where everything's left since it was a, Mex a mexican um video that i was pulling stuff from you know you're on the right side of a person um which anyone knows um well maybe some people don't so u.s uh style wrestling everything's to the left you know, uh, so if you watch um, current products, WWE, or even back in the olden days, you'll see uh, when someone ties up, they they work the left arm. Or if you got your opponent on the ground, they work the left leg. Well, I don't know who started this or who does, divided it, but if you're if you're watching uh, Lucha Libre stuff, you'll notice they don't work the left; they work the right. So they work the right arm. They work the right leg. And then um, Japan, they'll work it all. You know, I mean, Japan uh, is just a hard nose, will break any bone in your body type of uh, atmosphere. So uh, it was just cool, uh, again, you know, working with the students and then seeing them out of nowhere pull off the move that you just showed them last week. You know, it just uh, – I mean, I'm sure, Bobby, you're the same way when you start, you know, coaching uh, your kids. <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, just yeah, being able to see like them to take something. Yeah, just being able to see them uh, absorb the knowledge that you gave them, and then they're able to just produce it. You know, so it was, it was kind of cool. You got like a awesome. proud papa seeing it mature. Well, that's right. like some of, in relation to it, like some of my favorite matches of kids that I've coached is they don't always even win them. It's just that when they listen and they do what they're told, and like they're making the adjustments. Most of the time they do win those, but it's just like we call that being coachable. You know, just just that aspect of it is phenomenal. Right. <clears throat> but anyhow, that was, um, you know, that's what I'm coming off of. So it was a great night of training. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just nice, you know, seeing them uh, produce. But and speaking of Pritchard's so book, I actually just got in the mail that in the mail last week. I was going to. Lend that to you so you can take a look at it. It's like a step-by-step -step training guide, basically, for what to do really? each, each uh, session. 
that would be uh, that'd be cool. Um, you know, Tom Pritchard. I've I've been around Tom for you know we've been in and out of each other's company. I guess for the last couple of years. You know, when you hang out with Herb Simmons, Herb Simmons knows everyone, and everyone knows Herb Simmons. I mean, when you've been in the business fifty years, uh, and you're known as the last of the Mohicans, and you're known to pay off your guys, uh, meaning some uh, promoters will promise big money to get you in, and once you do your job, uh, somehow your envelope is lighter than what you expected it to be. Well, Herb Simmons awesome. is not like that. <laughs> Herb Simmons is known to be a good payoff man. So if um, you work out a deal to come in, He's going to live up to that deal. Um, so 50 years in the business, being a good uh, payoff man, everyone wants to work with you. Everyone knows you. And I tell you, everyone, you know, mouth, uh, word of mouth is a big thing in the rest of the business. And that's how you get a lot of people to come in is like a, a Terry Funk will say, you know, Herb Simmons is a great guy to work for. Uh, so, you know, Terry Funk might tell, um, anyone, you know, you can just say like, um, uh, Bradshaw, he could tell Bradshaw, you need to go work for him because he, what you are told you're going to make, you're going to make it. So Bradshaw comes and then Bradshaw tells Ray Mysterio. So Ray Mysterio comes because they want to work for people who are honest and is going to pay um, you know, what, what your guarantee it is. Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah. Cornett, I guess yesterday mentioned her and our big show coming up on his podcast yesterday. That's a huge right. shout out. Yeah. I mean, Jim Cornette, I mean, he's like a historian when it comes to wrestling. I mean, the stuff that I have in my head doesn't compare is like, a an 18th of what is in Jim's head. Um, plus, you know, Jim, uh, he, like I said, he's an historian. So any like faction, whether it be St. Louis or Memphis, um, he tries to collect everything for it, whether it be programs, whether it be actual VHS tapes. Um, you know, he started as a photographer. So, you know, pictures. Um, but Jim has a full collection, and I might have said this on an earlier podcast, uh, Jim has a full collection of the uh, Wrestling at the Chase programs, um, which the programs, it's not like uh, it's not like these uh, in the back where it's got our pictures on it and the date. You know, these programs opened up like a magazine, basically. It was a, a, a cover. It was an inside uh, newsletter. It was a back cover. Um, you know, it told you what uh, just happened last month and what you got to look forward to this month and what was going to be on the TV programs, you know, because those newsletters would cover all that. And, uh, you know, Wrestling as the Chase was on air for a lot of years. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, Larry Matisek was, uh, at the time, he was the one that was making those. Uh, so it was kind of cool that Jim Cornette, who's never lived in St. Louis, you know, he's in the Kentucky, Tennessee area. I think he's in Kentucky, but, uh, you know, he did the Memphis run. Um, liked St. Louis so much that he had to have a complete collection. And to top it off, I know for a fact Herb Simmons is the one that helped him finish that collection because he was missing a few. And uh, Herb Simmons is actually the one that gave it to him. So that, that's now, an awesome Nate, shout let's out. Let's not overlook at the beginning of that story. Jim said faction instead of fraction this time. Yep, he does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I see it's going to start already, huh? Improving. <laughs> well, anyway, so it was great to see a shout out from Jim. Uh, Jim came in a couple of years ago for us, and uh, I tell you, if there's anyone that you want to sit and talk to, uh, Jim is the guy because uh, Jim has been in every single promotion there is. You know, uh, he's been in them all, you know, even currently, you know, he was in WWF, WWE, he was in WCW, he was in the NWA, he was in TNA, he was in Impact, he was actually in AEW, so, I mean, 
And Ring of Honor. With them all. Brett, Ring of Honor. Uh, so, I mean, the amount of knowledge that's in that guy's head is just unbelievable. Yeah. And if you ever seen him on uh, uh, WWE, used to put out uh, some uh, videos about uh, like their treasures, uh, like trying to find historical pieces of clothing from other wrestlers. Um, you know, they wanted uh, they wanted his uh, racket. Uh, that he used to beat everyone over the head with, and uh, you know, so he took him on a little tour of his house, and upstairs in his attic, the whole attic is uh, furnished, and it's just all full of wrestling stuff. Uh, I mean, I would love just to sit there and just read everything that he's got. I mean, it's just really cool seeing all that stuff, um, and he's kept it all. And actually, too, if you listen to his podcast. He used to write everything down in a book. So whether he was in WWF or WCW, he would be able to tell you a certain year, a certain day of the month, where you guys were at, what was the headliner, um, who, how was the finish, what was the payoff, how many were in attendance. Uh, if it was something weird like it was a snowstorm, you know, he wrote it all down. And uh, I recently found out uh, J.J. Dillon was the same way. And because uh, J.J. Dillon has a, a book coming out. It might be already, even already out. But uh, it was done by J.J. Dillon and his uh, daughter, Pam. And I think Scott Teal. Um, but it was basically uh, all thrown together from J.J. Dillon's notes. Because J.J. would do the same thing. He would write it all down. So I'm kind of looking forward to that book coming out. Because that, you know. J.J. Dillon was a big four horseman. I mean, he was the manager of the four horsemen. So just to uh, find out what was going back, uh, going down in that era, because, uh, you know, the four horsemen, when they were running, you know, they were the biggest thing happening. So just, uh, you know, you, you hear about the Rick St- Rick Flair stories. You imagine uh, being the fly on the wall like J.J. Dillon and seeing all of them, you know, the Arn Anderson stories, the Tully Blanchard stories, the Ole Anderson, uh, besides the Ric Flair, because, you know, he was he was running them all. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. Well, he was part of the yeah, WCW at one time, wasn't he? I couldn't hear you. What? It wasn't, uh, didn't J.J. Dillon, wasn't he the head of WCW at one time, or is that somebody, or is that somebody else? Oh, no, he was. He was even, uh, I mean, he wasn't like the president, but, you know, he was always either a booker or uh, someone who was uh, high up, you know, putting the stuff together. Because he was the same way in WWF. Uh, he might have been WWE at the time, but he was out there doing the same thing. So, yeah, uh, I don't think it's yeah. out yet. The only book I'm seeing from him is Wrestlers Are Like Seagulls from 2005. From McMahon to McMahon. Okay, yeah, I was just... Uh, I was uh, on Facebook, and uh, his daughter is on uh, is on my list of friends, and uh, she was talking about it. So it might not be out yet, but uh, I'm looking forward forward to it when it does come out. Yeah. Yep. Um, Ask Pam when the uh, release date, the publication date is. Yeah, I'll have to look that up, or if anything, she will be in town May 13th. And speaking of May 13th. Uh, just announced today, Haku is going to be there. So, uh, you know, Haku has been with us um, a couple years now. Uh, he'll pop in and uh, do a super show with us. Um, and I reposted it today because it was on Facebook, and I just seen it like a half hour ago. And I put down in the comments, he is the nicest person that you never want to piss off. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> he is the one of the toughest sons of bitches there is, and everyone has a haku story that if you ever travel down the road with them, that uh, you know you hear about or you see it firsthand. Or uh, I mean, if you look him up, you know J- Chris Jericho has an awesome story about getting stuck. I don't know if it was in Puerto Rico or if it was in Mexico, 
Um, but he was being detained, uh, and Chris Jericho was, was talking about how uh, the police officers were basically just detaining them because he they wanted money, and he wasn't going to give them any money. Um, and uh, so they were detaining him, and his plane was actually taking off, and Haku came in uh, to see what the hell was going on, and then they ended up fighting all the police officers. Uh, and then they end up getting put in jail, <laughs> you know, and so they both missed their planes. Sorry, I'm spitting, but they both missed their planes. Uh, but I mean, who the hell in their right mind actually goes and, and, and tries to fight the cops? Um, but you know, there's stories about him being in a bar and, uh, people, you know, back in the day, if they found out that you're a wrestler or they knew you're a wrestler cause you're famous, they would always like to challenge you. And, uh, you know, there was always a golden rule that uh, if you got challenged, you better beat their ass because you're a professional wrestler and they're not. So uh, there's stories about how he was really good at popping people's eyes out of their socket. Uh, and there was a lot of stories about that, uh, that some guy was challenging him and, you know, he was cool. Brother, I don't want nothing. Brother, just leave me alone. And then eventually, you know, you, you poke the sleeping bear too much, the bear is going to come out, and out comes your eyeball. So, I mean, it's kind of the guy you never want to piss off. I mean, I, I've talked to him plenty of times. We drink whiskey together. Uh, speaking of that, I'm out of whiskey, so I had to rely back at my uh, white Russian. That used to be my favorite drink until I found uh, Gentleman Jack. Oh, White Russian is still my favorite. Yeah. But uh, it was very nice, very friendly, and very open. Would talk to you if you have a question or if you uh, wanted some advice about your match or what you should do. You know, he would have no problem. Even the Barbarian, the last time they both came together, uh, and both of them were so friendly. Um, until you disrespect him. Until you disrespect him, which I never have, and I never plan on it. So uh, he will always be on my good side, because I will always be on his good side. But anyway, let's talk about the topic of the night. So, yeah, um, you know, everyone knows that me and Bobby are wrestlers, and Nathan is not. And Nathan uh, wanted to talk about different gimmicks that, you know, were in the WWF or WWE or, uh, unfortunately, WCW and TNA, because there's some in TNA that I didn't know about that kind of crazy. Uh, but different gimmicks uh, of characters that, you know, worked or didn't work. Um, and so, you know me, I, I like to dig into stuff. And, you know, off the top of my head, I could already talk to you about Bastion Booger on how nasty that guy was. Um, but, you know, that was like so many, he was so many different characters until he got to Bastion Booger. Because um, he was like a, a maniac. Um, you know, he wrestled under his real name for a bit. But uh, Bastion Booger, he, growing up, he was probably like the grossest wrestler <laughs> that I knew. I mean, that I, I didn't know, but seen on TV. Because he was big and fat, and Vince had him wearing this weird-ass outfit that uh, it was gray, uh, gray shorts, and he had like pieces of leather going across his 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 waist and body, just to show off what you don't want to see, you know, in a big fat guy. And he was bald, and what really tops it off is when you're fat. Your thighs rub together, and when your thighs rub together, they change colors, and they get this, like, nasty skin, and, you know, he would uh, sit on people, uh, you know, he kind of did the earthquake thing, where he would run and hit the ropes and do, like, a squat down on you, and when he squatted, and you see this nasty-ass fucking skin, ugh, it was just so gross. Uh, but, you know, 
Uh, he was there for like a year, maybe two years. So evidently, you know, sometimes a bad gimmick or a bad character uh, in some people's eyes uh, can make money. And so, I mean, but anyway, so the list will be like ones that should never have happened. Some that, you know, it's a weird gimmick, weird character, but, it, you know, it works. Like, Bobby, you talked about Eugene earlier. You know, yeah. some people put him on the list. But I liked Eugene. Uh, uh, Nick Dinsmore. Uh, Dinsmore. Dinsmore. Man, I can't yep. pronounce his name. Nick Dinsmore. Um, I mean, when he wrestled uh, prior to the Eugene gimmick, I mean, he was a, a, a Matt Maniac. He, he, he was a he's teacher because he, uh, he used to teach at uh, Ohio Valley uh, Wrestling. I mean, the guy was an athlete, but his gimmick, I, I really liked it. So he played it, uh, I don't know if he can say the word. He was mentally handicapped. <clears throat> and uh, he would just do, like, the moves of other people, other superstars. So he would do the people's elbow. Uh, you know, he would do the Hulk Hogan leg drop. Uh, but you can tell that he wasn't mentally all there. But he pulled it off so well. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he would wave <laughs> like that, smile and wave. Like, I was a guy. Fan. Always. Yeah, I, I'm a fan. You know, so, I mean, that's a gimmick that I think worked well. I said, I'm I going through my list here, and I knew Bastion Booger was on here twice. He also played Friar Ferguson. That was another one that got canceled pretty quick because it says that one of the churches in New York was filing complaints pretty good. Catholic Church of New York. You know, but what, Nick, uh, what Nathan was saying, uh, you know, uh, Kevin Sullivan's character was a Satanist, and that's a whole religion to itself, where the whole Friar Tuck you know, that was a portion of, the, I guess, the Catholic religion. So they they had a right to uh, get a little mad or pissed off about it. But, uh, you know, Kevin Sullivan, you know, I mean, who's going to say Kevin Sullivan's not portraying it right? Because, you know, if you ever watched that shit, he portrayed it pretty well. Yeah. But, you know, so Bobby's list and my list are probably two different lists. Um, you know, I research from everywhere, from YouTube to Google. Uh, uh, I love to watch old wrestling shows. So it's, um, you know, he even told me his reference or where he got his stuff, which is not the same as where I got it. But, you know, um, uh, I'm sure a lot of these people are going to be on the same list. But kind of crazy. <laughs> so you got, you got Max Moon on yours, the man from the future? Uh, so, yeah, but, you know, uh, I'm going to add a stipulation to where some of these guys on where I found all this stuff, some of them only had one or two matches, so you really can't, I mean, you can say the gimmick didn't work, but I don't remember the gimmick. So Max Moon, I, I don't, I don't remember watching him or seeing him. Well, the gimmick got uh, taken over, it says, by, uh... Someone, um, his cyborg hailing from the future, and he was taken over by Paul Diamond, but it was played by Conan. That's right. Uh, all right, so Max Moon, uh, Conan, what was his? He had a couple of uh, different ones. Uh, let me see if I can't find him real quick because if that's early out, Mexico. If you look up Conan's early Mexico stuff, the man was just... I didn't realize how powerful he was. Well, see, I always thought Conan looked really good when he came into WCW for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had the long hair. I think he had the body uh, of an awesome wrestler. Oh, uh, he was but good. Conan... He was he. God, so that might be the same, the same character that... Uh, um, it was in WWF. And it was like a Transformer character. I mean, it, it had a like a an armored suit. Uh, yeah, on it's, him. it's almost like tubes all over it. 
Oh, man, I don't see it. But it might not have been this, because I never remember seeing it, so I don't think I wrote it down, because, I mean, it, it must have been a really quick thing. Um, it said there was a lot of contract issues, so he left pretty quick, and that's why Paul Diamond took it over. Well, I heard him and Vince got into it. Not really. I mean, it could have been a contract issue, um, but a lot of times if you get, you know, there's only one person who can actually yell at the boss and still stay in the company, and that's Shawn Michaels. I don't know if they had a personal <laughs> thing where, you know, Shawn Michaels can do whatever the hell he wants and still, you know, well, have a contract. It, it says something where you can wrestle a fucking broom, have a five-star match, and still draw money. <laughs> I mean, that if, makes if you're sense. making Vince money, he's gonna love you, no matter what. But it's so many times that he bailed on the company, like, "Oh, my knee hurts, I need a break," or "My back hurts, I need to." And both times he was a champion, and he would just drop the belt. And one time he dropped the belt because he said he lost his smile. I mean, you're at the head of the table. And you're saying, uh, I, I, I want to quit because I lost my smile. I mean. What kind of happy horse shit is that? <laughs> right. Your smile has nothing to do with getting in the ring and wrestling. <laughs> He's got to drive the bill crazy. A smile for that. Um, you know, so let's just, uh, you know, so back in the 80s, you had Brooklyn Brawler. Uh, which I liked the gimmick. You know, you knew what he was. He was uh, basically there to uh, get the other people over. Um, but then he uh, he was like the first. He was actually called MVP at one point in time. He dressed up like a baseball, like a pitcher. Uh, he colored his face like a baseball. Uh, I thought his name was that, Screwball. So he was MVP first. And then that character went away, and then the baseball strike happened like a year or two later. So they brought the character back, and he was Abe Knuckleball. Knuckleball. That's, that's, I knew it was a pitch. Yeah, but <laughs> either way, it didn't work again. Um, but uh, then you have, like, Kane. You know, Kane's character worked. You know, Kane was the Undertaker's brother. Uh, they had a great storyline about how the Undertaker, you know, accidentally caught his house on fire and killed his parents and killed his brother, but somehow magically his brother survived. And, you know, the storyline went crazy because uh, I think eventually it turned to Kane was the one that actually set the house on fire, but yeah. the Undertaker thought he was the one. But before Kane was Kane, We'll go one back. He was Dr. Yeah. Isaac Yankum. You know, yeah, that's and, popped uh, up on a few of my list, too. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Dr. Isaac Yankum, he was uh, J uh, Jerry Lawler. You know, he's we've been talking about him all in the podcast, but uh, he was uh, Jerry Lawler's personal <laughs> dentist. Um, and, uh, you know, no one likes a dentist, so the character didn't go really go over well. Uh, but it, it did, it worked out well for Kane, or um, it worked out well for him because at least showed the fans and showed Vince that, you know, he can do the moves, he looks, he's a big guy, he can work well with people, so they just, you know, repackaged him. But what I wanted to get to was before he was Dr. Isaac Yankum, he was, uh, I got it down here, he was... The Christmas creature. I remember that. He was dressed up like Santa Claus mixed with a Christmas tree. Uh, so he, 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 I, and the funny thing is, if you listen to Kane, there's a, uh, he talks about it in that same uh, WWE treasures uh, where they go hunting for, they were hunting for Kane's first original mask. Uh, Not for Kane talked about it. And, uh, Kane said that, that that character was only out for like a month, but so many people videotaped that match and now reshows it on YouTube that he's he's known to be the Christmas creature. <laughs> you know. 
Well, I found one that I posted in last week's podcast where he was the Unabomber. Yeah, he was the. I think that was his first. Well, you know, Kane actually started up in our area because uh, he started at RCW, which you know, me and Bobby uh, ran some shows there for, uh, did some matches for as well. Um, so I mean, that was uh, kind of cool being in the same. Uh, promotion that Kane had came from. Um, you guys were so good, you chased him out. He had to go to WCW and then WWE. Well, I don't, I don't know if he ever went to WCW, but he was in uh, Smoky Mountains uh, and then, then the WWE because Smoky Mountains is where he was when The Undertaker went down to wrestle him as the Union Bomber. And that's, that match is... You know, Undertaker went back up to Vince and say, we need him. And that's what got him going, you know. Uh, there's uh, uh, a person on here. I know Bobby likes this guy's character, but it made this list. And uh, that was Mike Awesome. Now, Mike Awesome that in ECW. Chick thriller. Fat Chick Thriller. That, that was his actual him. name in WCW. The Fat Chick Thriller. Uh, and Mike Awesome was um, uh, one of the just last. Just step back a second. Movies. Step back a second. Glenn Jacobs, back when he had his long curly hair and he wore the speedo, did one match in WCW Saturday Night in Macon, Georgia. He uh, his name was Bruiser Mastino. All right. <laughs> that didn't that was long. <laughs> right. Well, one match. But yeah, so Mike Austin, uh, he was a, a great ECW champion. Not going to lie. You know, was good... I wanted his bus. It was pretty cool. His bus? Yeah. Is that Remember what that bus? He yeah, so... 70s style? So yeah, so after he was the fat chick thriller, he was the 70s man. So he came out in, uh, you know, the 70s styles like... Uh, uh, what's that John Travolta movie where Dis uh, Disco Saturday Fever? Night is that what? Saturday, Saturday Night Fever. Yeah. So he had the white, you know, suit with the bell bottoms and you know, open hair chest. You know, uh, I think they always made those yeah, games overlap though. I don't think it was like hard stop on one and jump to the other. I think they overlapped a little bit. Well, when he first so the the the, the funny story about Mike Awesome and I don't have you ever heard of Mike Awesome, Nate? No. All right, so Mike Awesome, when ECW was, like, bleeding and everyone was jumping ship, Mike Awesome was the ECW champion. And he uh, got pulled by Eric Bischoff from WCW, you know, uh, dangling some money at him. And uh, he started appearing at, at WCW shows, but he's still the ECW champion. And uh, so, you know, lawsuits happened, and uh, they got uh, they got it settled where Mike Awesome would wrestle someone at ECW uh, to lose the strap to so he can go to WCW. But the funny thing is, is Paul Heyman, I don't know, some people say he was taking money from Vince. Some people say Vince was just paying... Paul Heyman for his talent, uh, but they got Taz, which at the time was in WWE, but was formerly an ECW champion, to come back and wrestle in ECW to wrestle Mike Awesome for the ECW heavyweight belt. So this is like the only one time where you have an ECW promotion with a contracted WCW wrestler and a contracted WWE wrestler going against each other. And Mike Austin dropped the belt to Taz at the pay-per-view, even though Taz was a WWE contracted wrestler. Uh, it's overly it's complicated. Kind of crazy. Very complicated. And there was a lot of lawsuits going back and forth between ECW and WCW. Because, you know, at the time, WCW loved to hire away the champions and get people to do shit with the belts, like uh, Alundra, Bra uh, Alundra Blaze, where he brought her in. She was currently the WWE Women's Champion, uh, changed her name to Medusa, 
and on live TV, she held up the woman's WWE title and threw it into a trash can and said that she was now at the place where, you know, badass women wrestle WCW, you know. So it's kind of crazy shit like that. You know, uh, Lex Luger did that. He wasn't the champion at the time, but he was being pushed to be the next Hulk Hogan. Um, you know, Vince had him doing the Lex Express. He was all American, you know, pulling the same shit of uh, say your prayers, take your vitamins, and uh, body slamming Yokozuna, just like Hulk Hogan body slammed on the, Andre the Giant. You know, he was supposed to be the next Hulk Hogan, but uh, they let his contract expire, and he was working on a weekly basis with them. And he wanted to leave WWE and go back to WCW. Uh, and so he did it. And he did it on, like, there's a pay-per-view uh, that Sunday that he worked for WWE. And that Monday, he showed up on Nitro. Um, you know, and, and you could say that it was because WWE worked you more than WCW did. You know, there's a lot of times where... You know, they were working 300-plus days, you know, in WWE, but that's how they made their money. And you worked less in WCW, but when Lex did that, Eric wasn't sh too sure on him, so he gave him, like, a really shitty contract, not expecting Lex to jump, and he jumped anyway. So he actually paid Lex Luger less than what he was making for from WWE to come. Um, so it's, it's kind of crazy. You think he was getting pushed to be the next big star and then just left the company. But, you know, Rick Rude did the same thing. Um, you know, it was funny because uh, he actually appeared on Raw and Nitro on the same day. And that was because uh, Raw was videotaped. Uh, some Mondays were videotaped and then some Mondays were live. So he knew that the videotaped airing would be on the same day that he would come live in WCW because WCW was live every Monday. So he was you know, on both channels at, on the same day. And it, it was funny too because uh, in WWF, he was part of uh, DX, which is a big faction there. And he had the beard. And the same day, he's on WCW Nitro, and he ends up becoming part of the NWO, and he was clean-shaven. Uh, you, know, you know, it's just it's funny little knowledge. Um, but, you know, I always say the two people in the industry that were really great and never got their props was Rick Rude and Mr. Perfect. Uh, yeah, they were... They were awesome wrestlers, and uh, they never made it to the very top. I mean, they always were like uh, mid-carters, or they would throw, like WCW would throw uh, um, a heavyweight version of the title on Rick Rude, um, but it was, it was a time where WCW had their title, but they're still kind of part of the NWA, so they had the NWA international title, uh, international heavyweight title, and that's what they threw on him. So he never made it to, like, WCW heavyweight champion, just like Mr. Perfect never made it to the WWF heavyweight champion. I mean, he was plenty of intercontinental champions. Uh, I mean, he did, Mr. Perfect did make it to uh, the AWA. He was a heavyweight champion for them. <coughs> but uh, in the big two, neither one of them made it to the very top, but they were great people. Um, again, it's kind of like I would say Roddy Roddy Piper is the third one on that. Yeah. Uh, he was never a heavyweight champion uh, in the big two, but he was an excellent worker and excellent talker. All three of them were excellent talkers. Uh, it's kind of hard to have. The complete package, you know, the looks, the wrestling skill, and the mouth, and all three of them had it. 
but at the time, you know, they didn't put the belts on him. It's kind of crazy. Uh, man, totally off topic. Piper and, uh, Valentine. Piper in Valentine. Anytime I think of Piper, it's always about that uh, dog collar match with him and Valentine. That was yeah. a classic. Yeah, that's a, a crazy match. Uh, I mean, they were they busted. I don't know who's. I think it was Rowdy's uh, eardrum that got busted open, bleeding out of it. Uh, still carried on with the match. Uh, so you know his equilibrium was all weirded out um, so. anytime. But. Uh, yeah, very good match. I probably watch that once every couple of years. Um, great. Uh, you guys so got, I got one on my list here that was pretty terrible. If we, you go on the next one? Yeah, yeah. How about the Yeti? The Yeti? Yeah. Do you remember yeah. the Yeti? Oh. That was a he, horrible. He did that uh, combination bear hug slash humping with uh, the giant. Yeah. So he's part of the league. In WCW, WCW, uh, Kevin Sullivan had a group. Um, Dungeon of Doom. Yeti. Yeah, the Dungeon of Doom. And they had all ca different characters. And I'm going to bring up one name uh, after we talk to him about Yeti. Yeti was a person that was dressed up as a mummy. You know, out of ancient Egypt. <laughs> and, uh, you know, slow as fuck walking to the ring. Slow doing anything because he's a mummy. And, and he walks dude, to the ring like a mummy. Hands out. Yeah, walks to the ring like a mummy. Got it. He, he didn't have an actual match. He was just, like, interference or, like, a guy jumping on someone who was already uh, getting beat up. And, uh, oh, my God, they even describe it as the Yeti dry-humping Hulk Hogan uh, because <laughs> he was bear-hugging him, but he was so <laughs> stiff. He, he was so stiff because he was all wrapped up like a mummy, so he couldn't really well, do anything either. He was bear-hugging one side while the giant was bear-hugging the other side. So they were having a threesome in the ring. Yeah, they were definitely running a train there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's move on from the Getty. Uh, well, they did begin the Giant Super Ninja for one show at World War Three. The Giant Super Ninja. Super Ninja. Yeah, I don't remember that one at all. No. But another crazy character. The Dungeon of Doom had a bunch of crazy characters. Um, one guy who I liked in WWF was uh, John Tenta, uh, Earthquake. Um, you know, um, the Hogan-Earthquake feud, uh, I enjoyed. Uh, Earthquake I was a huge guy who could wrestle, um, and his uh, finishing move is he would hit the ropes a few times and then squat land on you, on your chest, kind of like Yokozuna used to do. He would squat land on you. Um if you ever watch Japan wrestling or Japanese wrestling, there's a, a match with him. And so John Tenta used to be like a Yokozuna uh, in Japan where he would do sumo wrestling. I don't think he was a Yokozuna because I know that was a high title, but yeah, he was, was like sumo Jordan wrestler. King. But he was a sumo wrestler. And there was another a Japanese guy who used to be a sumo wrestler who switched over to wrestling, and they were having a match together. And for some strange reason, he wanted to get the best of John Tenta, and uh, John wasn't having it. And the match was horrible, but you could tell everything was that was thrown was for real. Uh, they beat the piss out of each other. Uh, because uh, one, I, the Japanese wrestler, I assume, was mad that uh, he, the, the John Tenta, was was at one time a sumo wrestler and had a bigger name than he did, and he uh, uh, was all about how uh, he could beat his ass, and uh, it ended up being a no contest. Um, but uh, it was a, a horrible, great match. I would say that because. Uh, 
you're going to feel the tension building up in the match, and then it just explodes, and uh, they just go crazy on each other. But so in WCW, in the Legion and Legion of Doom, um, the Dungeon of Doom, uh, unfortunately, my 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 guy was named Shark, uh, and his outfit had a picture of a shark on it. He had a beard like uh, he did uh, as Earthquake, but they had colored it in like it was his teeth. Uh, and he was like Shark Man. Uh, who the fuck ever thinks of this stuff? When he first came to uh, WCW, you know, he was known as Earthquake. So when he first came to WCW, they brought him in and changed his name to Avalanche. I'm okay with that. You know, Earthquake, Avalanche, both powerful things that can happen to you. Natural uh, disasters. Right. But uh, then the switch you to shark, uh, bad character gimmick, very bad. Uh, but to go along with that, you know, I hate the dog, a guy who's coming in on May 13th, Mr. Tugboat. But, you know, Mr. Tugboat was, Earth, was Earthquake's partner for a while. You know, you know, when he went bad, he became Typhoon. But when everyone started jumping back to WCW, he was the shock master. And, uh, you know, uh, this would be a you great part that for being you to a put that Star Wars fan? <coughs> Yeah, so this is a great part for you to put that uh, thing I sent you. Hey, this is Fred Ottman, Tugboat Typhoon, the shock master, the B-A-double-D, Big Steel Man, coming at you live from Tennessee. Scott Wilder Promotions and SICW has teamed up to bring me to St. Louis, Missouri. That's right, at the Aviator Hotel and Ballroom on Saturday, May the 13th. I'm looking forward to seeing all the SICW fans, and I want to thank promoter Herb Simmons for his 50 years of keeping the memories alive in St. Louis. That's right, as a wrestler and as a wrestling fan myself, thank you, sir, for everything you've done for the business. Um, Tugboat uh, did a little promo for us uh, for the May 13th show that he's going to be on. Uh, but uh, so as the shock master, whose ideal was Ole Anderson, um, he spray painted a stormtrooper's helmet, a glitter color. So it's just all glitter. And he was wearing like this furry coat. Uh, with the stormtroopers helmet on and they wanted him to bust through the wall like the Kool-Aid man uh, and it worked during the practice run but live on TV they stuck a little board on the bottom and when he busted through he tripped on the wood and fell and his helmet come rolling off so this big monster mystery man was uncovered, demasked within the first couple of seconds. Um, and we had, I had posted that on when we talked about it in a podcast before earlier, but WWE, believe it or not, folks, actually watches our podcast and manually copy wrote that, so I won't be putting it in there again. That's fine. Please don't talk about it. You can YouTube it. It, it is a funny five-minute bit. <coughs> that's well worth viewing. But, you know, if you talk, talk about to Tugboat... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was if going you to talk to Tugboat at the time, because after that happened, he did just start wrestling uh, as a shop master with no helmet, uh, you know, just just him, you know. But, all right, Bobby, who's next? Uh, how about the guy that was Vinny Vegas that had another terrible gimmick that he ended up turning out pretty good? The Oz? Kevin Nash. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah he, had a, he had an okay career. I guess he had an okay career. I mean, he's the one that whole started the revolution, basically, of the NWO and the Monday Night uh, Wars. Um, Six times. Besides, besides of Vinny Vegas. 
He was actually a couple uh, in, in the Oz. He was one other name. Uh, I have, because I have him wrote down. Uh, what was Take his? Everything. Master Blaster. Oh, so I, he was. Yeah. He was Vinny Vegas, dressed up in a suit, you know, tuxedo. Uh, Master Blasters was like a ripoff of. Uh, uh, what was that old uh, movie with uh, Mad Max? Mad Max. Uh, so, you know, it was uh, the Apocalypse tag team, because it was actually two of them for a while, uh, until they broke up, and then Kevin Ash was just the Master Blaster. Um, and then he was Oz, which who the hell would ever come up with this? Uh, you know, funny, if you can't pull this up, Nate, no problem, but it's very worth you guys YouTubing and Googling because he had a fake head that he would put on. They had a wizard's cap and like this long draping um, uh, robe, and he was supposed to be like this Wizard of Oz character, um, and it was bad. It was horrible. All three of those characters, Vinny Vegas, you know, Vinny Vegas. You had glimpses of Kevin Nash in Vinny Vegas, uh, but the whole gimmick just didn't work for him. He actually was going to quit. Um, after that whole Oz scenario, uh, he was actually going to quit. And uh, I, I don't know who was the one that got him to go to. Oh, it was actually Shawn Michaels himself. Shawn had seen him work. And at the time, he wanted a bodyguard uh, to be like a partner up in uh, WWE. And he actually seen uh, Kevin Nash working and felt like he would be a good fit as a bodyguard for him. So he actually got Vince to bring him up. And, um, you know, that started the whole click. You know, Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash, um, Scott Hall, and uh, uh, Hunter. Uh, which is, you know, great that Kevin Nash and Scott Hall was both in the Click, which was a, a, a great, you know, team there, which eventually became DX, and then went back uh, to WCW and did uh, the NWO, which just, you know, uh, I mean, that's what started the whole Monday Night Wars. Uh, great. Uh I have one. One of you guys both know, Dustin Rose. He actually has a couple of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Seven. Yeah, seven, the one who kidnapped children. How did he yeah. think that was going to go over? How can you go from gold dust to kidnapping children and think the censors are going to be okay with that? I mean... You know, so he was... He's another one that's been in everything. In WCW, he was Dustin Rhodes. Uh, in WWE, at WWE, he was Gold Dust, which at the time was a crazy gimmick. Uh, you Very know, something that, uh, yeah, a normal person probably couldn't pull that off because uh, there was, even though behind the scenes, there were some gay wrestlers in the WWF at one time or another. You know, Pat Patterson came out that he was gay, and, you know, he was popular in the 70s, early 80s. So behind the scenes, you know, they're, they, you know, they existed. And I'm not saying it as a bad thing, but when you're openly on camera uh, being that flamboyant, that was like the first of its kind. That's so, I mean, that was... The top. That's not just gay. That's way over the top. Yeah. So, I mean... uh that could have been a very bad gimmick, but man, he pulled that one off. Uh, I mean, especially when he did the bit where he had uh, Tourette's. I love that part. Uh, he with got Booker electrocuted. T. Yeah, he teamed with Booker T, but he got electrocuted, and all of a sudden he had Tourette's. Oh, that was like the best version of Goldust. Um, but then uh, he left uh, WWE, and he became Black Rain in TNA. Uh, which was just a darker version of gold dust. Um, and then, you know, uh, of course, uh, he became seven. Um, and 
there's plenty of interviews out there that said that uh, those last two characters he didn't care for. Uh, and even at when he did seven, he eventually took off the mask and uh, on live TV and uh, talked about how crappy that uh, gimmick was and how he didn't want to be that gimmick anymore. And it's and he wasn't even that gimmick for that long because um, they were just starting uh, the promotions for him basically when he just pulled it and said, like, "Nope, mind doing this shit." Well, that's good because, I mean, at no, at no era is a gimmick where you're kidnapping children and, you know, is a positive thing. And that's not going to let, what parent is going to let them watch something where they're going to be afraid that Mr. Seven's going to come get them. Here, Johnny, right, go with right. Seven. Um, crazy ones. I'm just going to knock out some crazy ones. In ECW, there was a wrestler named Zombie who was an actual zombie. Now, this isn't old ECW, because it would have never worked. This was WWE's version of ECW. And he, you know, full dress paint. You know, this was back uh, when uh, that zombie TV show was, like, popular. Walking uh, Dead. Walking Dead, you know. So that, that was just coming out, and so... Vince is always like that. Whatever's popular on TV, he tries to pull from. Um, man, that one sucked. Um, Jim Anvil, uh, you know, he was with Bret Hart for the longest time, but after they split, they threw a mask on him, and they called him Who? W-H-O. That was his wrestling name. Who? I remember that one. Yeah. Uh, some of these things, just looking up and... Uh, you know, one that I thought worked, with, and it's funny, too, because there's a store attached. In WCW, Steven Regal was Lord Steven Regal. Uh, it was a British guy. Uh, and just like now, you can tell in the UK, it's a strong style. And um, he did that in WCW. But when he came up to WWF, or WWE at this point, uh, he the was man's the man. man's man. Uh, and so you're... You know, he was in WCW for so long, anyone who watched wrestling knew he was this British royalty, uh, hard, uh, you know, hard-nosed man, you know, that, and then you go up there, and now he's like a lumberjack, because uh, they had uh, promos of him uh, cutting down trees in the woods, and he's a man's man, was like his theme song. Um, yeah. And the it's funny strange. thing I wanted to point out. That's uh, a beer commercial. Over, <laughs> Could be. The, the, the funny thing that you guys need to search Bad, on YouTube, uh, they went over to the UK and he was fighting Daniel Bryan. Uh, or what was he in? Was it Daniel Bryan then? Brian Danielson? Brian Danielson. What, what is his real name? Brian Danielson. All right. So he was fighting him. And, uh, you know, Lord Re uh, Stephen Regal came out fighting Daniel Bryan. <laughs> But on his walk to the ring, uh, his music is uh, like a, a, it's just, there's no words, it's just sounds, but it it makes you know that a badass is walking to the ring. But all of a sudden they cut it and start playing, he's a man's man, and, uh, you know, for the rest of the time. And for a guy, they always say the funniest thing to do is to make someone break character when they're in the ring. And Lord, uh, I keep saying Lord Stephen Regal, but Stephen Regal, you know, he never breaks character, and he's just this badass guy. You know, when I told you those three, uh, Mr. Perfect, uh, Rick uh, Rude, I I would put Stephen Regal in there too. Well, maybe even throw uh, Fit Finley. Who? Fit Finley. Fit Finley, yeah. yeah. I say, guy. and I only think of him right now because there was a great match with him and the Man's Man. Against each other. Yeah. WCW. So anyway, in that match, you know, he's coming to the ring. He steps on the ring. And he, uh, <clears throat> anytime you step in a ring, you always uh, dust off your boots. You know, you, you, you slide your boots across the ring to get all the stuff off the bottom of them. And as he's doing it, he is just smiling. And just to see this guy who never smiles, you know, like smiling his ass off because they got him. You know, yeah. and even Brian Danielson, they look at him in the ring, and he is just laughing his ass off, too. 
it's uh I would say a great one to, to look and uh, and watch. Um, did you know WWE had some Ninja Turtles that wrestled for them? No, they are called no. the Toxic Twins. This was back when the Ninja Turtles movies were starting to come out, and they were very popular. Uh, they looked exactly like uh, the orange and the red. So Raphael and whoever the orange one was, uh, they were called. They are called the Toxic Twins, and uh, they only wrestled a handful of times because the fans did not care for them. Because uh, literally, they they were a spit image of a very bad costume of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, yeah. It would be like uh, trying to put a wrestler in a Frozen outfit and sitting out there <laughs> addressed as Elsa. It's just not going to yeah. work. No joke on that. Uh, well, let's see here. There was a wrestler named Renegade. Um, see, I remember Renegade. I didn't mind that one. Well, so Renegade was uh, a spoof of the Ultimate Warrior. So when Hulk Hogan had quit WWE and he was just doing his TV show, um, I forgot the name of it, but it's uh, basically that was a ripoff of uh, uh, that beach TV show with uh, Pamela Anderson. Baywatch. Baywatch. When they were lifeguards. Baywatch. Uh, Very his TV show was running. <laughs> his, his, Hogan's TV show was just a ripoff of that, basically. But then WCW lured him in, and like Hulk Hogan started wrestling everyone that he ever wrestled in the WWE. So they would bring in like Earthquake, uh, and uh, they brought. Um, <clears throat> they brought this guy in, uh, Renegade, who was a ripoff of the Ultimate Warrior. You know, he had the long hair. He did the tassels around his muscles. Um, but he wasn't the Ultimate Warrior, and you knew it. Uh, so he, he didn't last too long. And then after he got cut, literally like two months later, he committed suicide because he, like the stress of him trying to be someone he wasn't was getting to him. Uh, so that's kind of a horrible thing, but uh, they shouldn't have ever done it because he, he used to wrestle before he became the Renegade, uh, the Ultimate Warrior lookalike. Um, I'm not saying that he was great or anything, but uh, you know when you're trying to live up to the, you know, out of the 80s WWF, you know, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior is like the top two guys there. Uh, so that was kind of shitty that they even tried to do that to him. Um, so speaking of lookalikes, I got one I don't remember too much of. I remember the taglines, but Mr. America. I don't remember oh, that's that. Hulk Hogan. Yeah, but I mean, uh, did, they, Hulk did, Hogan they pass that? did they try to pass yeah. that as somebody else, or what did they, you know, was it kind of a tongue in cheek thing? Uh, so the storyline was Vince McMahon fired Hulk Hogan, uh, but Hulk Hogan appeared the next, uh, it was on SmackDown, never made it to Raw. Uh, it was a SmackDown thing. Uh, so he come back under a mask, and he was Mr. America. Uh, so the fans were then, supposed to know. Oh, uh, yeah, the fans knew who it was, and he would say everything that Hulk Hogan would say. He was just yeah, under a hood. It was kind of like the know. whole, uh, kind of the whole Dusty Rhodes, um, you know, back in the day uh, when he was the Knight Rider. Uh, no, I think it was. I think it was Knight Rider or something like that. Uh, everyone knew it was Dusty Rhodes. It's just that uh, he couldn't, at that time, I forgot the stipulation, but he couldn't wrestle as Dusty Rhodes in that promotion. So he he just donned a mask. <laughs> well, then if it's, it's for a storyline, I would not put that in the category as a bad gimmick. It's for the storyline. It wasn't supposed to be legit someone else. Yeah. I mean, it was so obvious. It was just like Andre the Giant when they put a mask on him. Uh, and he was the war machine. Uh, it was a tag team. Uh, Andre had left the WWF. Uh, and when they brought him back, uh, they put a mask on him. Why the hell would you put a mask on Andre without 
it being already known that it, there was Andre. You know, so it was just one of those things. And it's freaking uh, Andre, one of your biggest draws ever. Right. Uh, some stupid ones. Um, I got Dick's. Oh, yeah. I, I got him down on there, too. But there was a, a tag team called the Dicks. Uh, yeah. They were Chippendale dancers. I remember. Uh, them. <laughs> and the they funny thing is, in, uh, in, in uh, TNA, when TNA first started, they had a tag team called the Johnsons. Uh, and the Johnsons were a full body suit, and it was flesh skin. So uh, <clears throat> they called them the rustling penises. Uh, okay, didn't last long. But, you know, it was when TNA first started. So TNA, again, was not uh, on TV. It was pay-per-view only. You had to buy the pay-per-view. So, again, pretty much on pay-per-views, anything goes. Uh, and when, and I, when we talked about it, when I told you when I first saw TNA, it's tits and ass wrestling. That's always what I'm going to remember it as. Because that's, right. that's what it was when I first started watching it. Right. And I took the first pay per view that I uh, that I watched from TNA, uh, I just bought it. You know, I heard about it, never seen it because it was on pay per view. and uh, But I just bought it one time. And. On the entrance ramp, when you walk down to the ring, on each side was a cage, like a bird cage, and it had a hot girl in there that was barely wearing anything. And every now and then they would be dancing, and something would fly out. Um, and then eventually, they got uh, one of them uh, got put into a storyline where she was wrestling, wearing the same same stuff that she was when she was in the cage. So every different move that she did, both of them would fly out, one of them would fly out, and uh, eventually she lost her top completely, and she was still wrestling the girl. Um, and to be honest, I, I don't even know who won. That's enough <laughs> wrestling. Know. Who cared who won? The fans right. won. The fans <laughs> won. The fans. Yeah. You got your money's um, worth. There was... There was a tag team called the Ding Dongs. Uh, it's weird shit, man. Uh, the Repo Man. The, the Repo Man. So I know the wrong kind of you did earlier. The IR, IRS. So I didn't mind IRS either. Uh, I didn't mind Repo Man. Uh, I liked that he was like a little slithering snake. Uh, and he was more of a laughable character. Uh, you know, the stuff he did, you Knowing that he was part of Demolition and then to that. Right, right. Um, but even IRS, you know, he was tag teams with the Million Dollar Man. Uh, so, I mean, that kind of made sense to me. The Million Dollar Man, IRS. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, well, that's not now that so he was a rotunda. Uh, you know, knowing that he was a great wrestler before he got that name, I can see where, why couldn't he just wrestle as himself because he was that good. Because um, uh, I, I remember a great tag team, it was him um, and, uh, and one of the Steiner brothers. Uh, it wasn't Scotty, the Bulldog, uh, Bull. Uh, Rick. 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 Uh, they were... Uh, uh, man, what was the name of the tag team? It was like the universities are because they would come out in their in their sportsman jackets. Um, it was a great tag team. I can't think of the name of it, but university university had something to do with it. But it was a WCW slash NWA at the time. Uh, but they were Mike Rotunda and Rick Steiner, awesome tag team. Mm -hmm. Um, the Gobbly Gooker. I said that was my big one, just because of who it was supposed to be. Yeah. Well, who was it supposed to be? Well, the Me Undertaker was. The Undertaker was very much worried that that was what he was supposed to be, because when they reached out to the Undertaker to bring him up there, because he was wrestling in WCW, they had just was like talking about this 
Well, they, they brought out a big ass egg. And uh, they were talking about how on a certain day, I think it was a Survivor Series, uh, mm -hmm. that they were going to crack this egg or this egg was going to crack and this wrestler was going to come out of it. And this is about the same time where Undertaker's up there, you know, trying to get a job. And he's like, man, I don't want to be this, you know, thinking. <laughs> and they both came out that same year. Uh, it's just that they had other plans for The Undertaker, you know? There's an old show called Legends of the Round Table, and I believe it was Michael P.S. Hayes actually said that they planned on putting him in there, and he just, like, looked at Vince like, you really going to put this big motherfucker in this gimmick? And, like, they just kind of yanked him from it last minute. Oh, that would have been horrible. You know, The Undertaker, I'm sure we brought this up before, but he wrestled, his very first match was against uh, King Kong Brody. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruiser Brody and uh, he talks about it in uh, Stone Cold's podcast um, he was uh, Red River or Red something um, and he was in the mask and uh, you know green as uh, grass you know brand new into the company um, and he's wrestling Bruiser Brody and as he locks up he even says it he starts calling the match uh, which means he starts calling out different moves, uh, and you just don't do that uh, to a veteran, uh, nonetheless, Bruiser Brody. So Bruiser Brody just beat the piss out of fucking Mark, uh, well, the Undertaker, uh, and he even talks about how uh, the old wooden chairs that had slats in it, um, that uh, the Bruiser picked one up, and busted them over the back so bad that splinters of this chair was flying into the audience. Um, but I got another one kind of in that same realm. Uh, it was with Ric Flair. Now, uh, Nate was talking about Ric Flair being a bad gimmick uh, because he was married, but he was living on the TV like he was like... Uh, you know, uh, Playboy. God to all the girls are a pimp or something, you know. <laughs> but but I say that was a great. If you read his book, he actually did, you know, sleep everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's right. what Jonathan said. They were talking about it. <laughs> it was a great gimmick because he lived that gimmick. I mean, what his mistakes was is he got married a few times while I was doing that gimmick. If he yeah. would have never got married, it would have been another thing. But the gimmick that I'm going to talk about is the Black Scorpion. Now, I, Bobby, were you, do you, did you ever see the Black Scorpion? I believe so, but I'm drawing a bit of a blank. All right. So this was kind of cool doing my research. So I remember watching this. Sting was getting beat up, and uh, he was being called out. And this guy magically showing up uh, under a hood, uh, and no one knew who it was. And they were calling him the Black Scorpion because it was like him versus Sting. And uh, what ended up being was it was Ric Flair under the hood. Um, but during my research, it was great because at it was supposed to be the Ultimate Warrior. Uh, Ultimate Warrior had a falling out with uh, WWF, and they've had a lot of falling out. Uh, it's well documented that uh, at one point, Ultimate Warrior tried to stiff Vince McMahon for more money, or he wouldn't be he wouldn't go out to the ring that particular night, you know. And then he went out, wrestled. Uh, and he got the money he demanded, and then he got fired right on the spot. You know, so they had a bunch of uh, uh, spots like that with Vince and Ultimate Warrior. Which now, if you look at it, I mean, they even did a DVD, the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior, uh, where they just dogged him through the whole video. Uh, but then they patched up, made their difference, and now if, if you see WWE talk about the Ultimate Warrior, it's totally in a different hindsight. It's like uh, he's on a podium. You know, he was such a great man, such a great wrestler. You know, everything's positive if you talk about him nowadays. 
But he wasn't, was a, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a good man, personally. Well, he just had the size and the statue. Uh, the you know, some people like his his promos where he would go off about being from planet whatever and coming down to save humankind. And uh, but you know, being a uh, an eighties kid, you know that did draw the kids to the WWF. But anyhow, uh, again, it was another Ole Anderson thing. Ole was in talks with the Ultimate Warrior, and Ultimate Warrior was promising that he was going to come in, that he was on the outs of the WWF. And so they had the Black Scorpion under a mask uh, to cover for the Ultimate Warrior not coming in when he was supposed to. Um, but it was supposed to be the Ultimate Warrior versus Sting, which is great because those two used to be a tag team back in the day. I mean, they first started together. They started in California together. They were, they were both bodybuilders. And then someone convinced them to, to go into wrestling. Um, and then, uh, you know, they were the Blade Runners uh, when they tagged together. So it was like a full circle of the Ultimate Warrior coming back to wrestle his buddy. Uh, but as their popular, famous gimmicks, Ultimate Warrior Sting. Um, but in the end, the Ultimate Warrior never fucking signed the deal and it never came. So they had to throw someone under the hood to be revealed, and they revealed it as Ric Flair, which a lot of people did not like because you already seen a lot of the Ric Flair versus Sting matches, you know, because... Back in the day, those are the two most famous people from WCW, Sting Absolutely. and Ric Flair. Uh, so you had a bunch of those matches already. Uh, so people were like kind of let down. But if they knew who it was supposed to be, being the Ultimate War, I mean, shit, I would have popped. Would have been great. So do you remember uh, this one keeps popping up on my list? Waylon Mercy. I don't know who that is. I said, I know it's Dan well, Spivey, just from reading this. Right. So, uh, Dan Spivey, uh, you know, he tagged with Sid Vicious. Uh, he tagged with uh, Undertaker, all in WCW. Dan Spivey was a guy who was known to, uh, to be an ass kicker, you know. Uh, but, yeah. And uh, I remember he wore, um, he was going bald at that time, but he still had the long hair. He had, like, the Hulk Hogan look. Uh, you know, long hair on the sides and the back, balling on top. Uh, but he, uh, uh, it's like a, a white jumpsuit type of, uh, you know, outfit. It didn't last long. That's <laughs> uh, a take on Robert De Niro's character from the movie Cape Fear. Yeah. yeah. Awesome movie. Just bad gimmick. Um, yeah. I didn't even see him on my list. Um. Yeah, but you had brought up uh, Chavo Guerrero's character, uh, Ker White. Kerwin White, uh, yeah. which is, you know, he was uh, Chavo Guerrero forever. Everyone knows who he was, you know, Eddie's uncle, uh, part of the whole Guerrero line. Uh, but then they decided to switch him to him saying he didn't want to be known as a, a Mexican wrestler that he was uh, Kerwin White. Uh, so he bleached his hair, uh, so he was now blonde. Um, he basically dressed like he was like from Miami Vice. He was like a pro golfer. He would drive down to the ring in his golf court. Uh, golf court. Oh, man. Sorry. It's getting late. Golf, golf cart. Um, uh, yeah. He was uh, uh, shown up on multiple lists. Uh, again, though, it was kind of a, a good storyline, I guess you can say, because mm -hmm. um, he's just such I a mean, good it, worker. He is such a good worker, but, uh, you know, I hate to say it, if it wasn't for Eddie, they probably would have got rid of him a long time, because him and Eddie were great together. Um, but without That's Eddie better. being there, hmm? Los Guerreros. Uh, yes. Uh, without Eddie being there, 
uh, unfortunately, he was just a, a worker. Uh, so this was a way to prolong his stay. Uh, now, granted, I think he worked for Impact for a while, and I think he was behind the scenes in AEW for a while. Uh, I don't know if he could still be there. Uh, a great worker, don't get me wrong. Um, I think the storyline could have been uh, was was decent because uh, he denounced being a Latino uh, Mexican. Uh, I mean, at least he had a storyline. Uh, like the other guys, like the dicks, and uh, you know, uh, like the one uh, Waylon Mercy. You know, they didn't really have a storyline. At least they they kind of built a storyline around him because they made him face all the Mexicans that were up there, Hooten Toot Guerrero, Rey Mysterio. So at least he had something to go with. Uh, this one I felt worked. Uh, Rosie. Um, Rosie is part of the whole uh, bloodline. Uh, and Rosie's character worked, I think. Uh, the superhero. <laughs> but that's the one I was going to get to. Superhero in training. Otherwise known as shit. Uh, and that's and that that was his name. So can you imagine a wrestler on WWE being called shit? Uh, superhero in training. But I think that gimmick worked so great. Uh, you know, he, he teamed up uh, with uh, Shane Helms. Um, what was his actual gimmick under uh, the mask? Hurricane. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was the, yeah, he was the hurricane. Hurricane was a superhero who had a great gimmick because uh, uh, they would bounce him off of the rock. And you can find that on YouTube land. Him bouncing uh, stuff off the rock was great. Uh, but then he had a sidekick. Rosie was like a 350-pound guy, though. Uh, he was um, Roman Reigns' brother. Um, so he he's in the bloodline. Uh, the heritage goes way back in the WWF. Um, but, uh, so bad gimmick, but he made it work. Uh, cause I would hate to be known as the shit wrestler. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think it worked out. Um, yeah. Uh, how about Teddy, Long putting, say, how about Teddy Long putting out Norman, the lunatic and holding his key. If he doesn't wrestle, he's going to put him back in the asylum. There's been a few Asylum gimmicks that have popped up on these lists. Right. Yeah, they, uh, they like to play that one a lot. <laughs> Popular in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Well, uh, Jim, you, weird... did say, you did say last week that you had to be crazy to be a wrestler, so. And you do. I still agree with that. Uh, so crazy one ones. Keep... Uh, you go ahead with crazy. Crazy ones that should have never happened. Uh, the fake Diesel and the fake Razor Ramon. Uh, so Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, uh, Razor and Diesel, they leave WWF. It might have been E at the time. Go to WCW. They become Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, NWO. Uh, but the thing is, is they fought... Uh, the characters belong to WWE. Uh, so Vince McMahon owned the character Diesel, owned the character Scott Hall. Well, he came up with this crazy idea. Well, I own the characters, damn it. And the characters are what, are, what is over. So let's just throw two other guys in the same fucking characters. Like a sequel to a movie. It works, right? Oh. <laughs> the funny thing is, is when Kevin Nash and Scott Hall left, and went down to WCW, they signed promissory contracts. So they are guaranteed a certain amount of money, promising that they would work for them because they didn't have the actual con contracts set up yet. So they were wrestling down there under these promise contracts. Well, once WWF started announcing that next week, live on Raw, we're going to bring Kevin, I mean, Diesel and fake, uh, I mean, not fake, Razor Ramon 
uh, WCW, uh, Eric Bischoff was like, no, no, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What? We don't have them actually signed to a contract? They started freaking out, and they actually paid them more to actually sign an actual contract because they were so scared that they were going to jump ship back to WWF and appear on Raw the next Monday. But they were... They didn't know anything about it because to them they they were already WCW guys, uh, so they actually WWF made them get paid more by creating this fake Diesel and faked uh, Razor Ramon, which the fake Diesel is on my list because that was Kane. Uh, so Kane, besides being the Christmas tree monster or whatever it was. But besides being Dr. Isaac Yankum, he was also the fake Diesel. Um, and he looked nothing like Diesel. Um, and I think Diesel's actually a little bit taller than King. So there was already a height difference. Uh, but the same thing goes for the fake Razor Ramon. Uh, looked nothing like Scott Hall. Uh, and it was just a bad idea. And they carried it on for a few months. So it wasn't something like they came out on that Monday and knew it didn't, it didn't work and just dropped it. No. They kept on with it. And it was just horrible. Just a very bad gimmick. Uh, That's one of those times Vince was hoping that uh, the people would just accept what he has to offer. Right. Yeah. Is this... Um, so I got one, the whole reason I dragged my Mortal Kombat cab into the scene here, we got Glacier and Mortis. I didn't mind I didn't that. I think they were that terrible, though. No, I mean, uh, Glacier was, uh, I was a Mortal Kombat kid, uh, okay. and I to no me, that was like, here. yeah, uh, so, uh. Uh, to me, that was kind of cool. Uh, I liked him. Uh, he was more like a Sub-Zero character. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know why they made the list. Uh, they made the list that, that I looked at. But Glacier has been on multiple lists, and I liked him. Like I thought his martial arts in the ring was pretty crisp. His little promos with the fake snow coming down were pretty cool. But it, like you, right. I was more like it. Hey, that's mixed martial arts. Wrestling and... Added up. Another one on here that I did not like was the Spirit Squad. You didn't like the Spirit Squad? Did not like the Spirit Squad. I thought they were pretty annoying. About as annoying well, as the Mean Street Posse. <laughs> I, I agree with you. They were annoying, but that was their characters. And... Uh, I think it was a, a good Ying versus Yang because it was them versus DX most of the time. Yeah. Uh, then it was like, you know, and they were like Vince McMahon uh, lackeys, um, which, you know, what I really thought, I really thought the Spirit Squad would break up, which they did, but I would thought more of them would have got a bigger push. Yeah, Kenny uh, Dexter first, had one for a little bit, and then obviously Dolph Ziggler. Right, uh, and they were the Spirit Squad was just male cheerleaders. There was like five of them, um, and they were only around for maybe one or two years. Uh, there was a couple standouts, uh, like uh, the not uh, Dolph, but the other one you said. Uh, Kenny they Dexter. were making him. Yeah, they were making him as like a. a Rick Flair, uh, um, Rick Flair was supposed to be his mentor uh, at the tail end of his uh, wrestling gig. I, I don't know what happened to him. I should probably look at that too because uh, I know there's a story behind it because I know I've heard it before, but I don't want to repeat it because I'll probably screw it up too much. Uh, but I really thought highly of him. Uh, I actually thought the whole Spirit Squad would break off somehow and all um, get to do something, especially since they made them into male cheerleaders. Uh, you you think that they, most of the time they punish you, 
uh, and then they, you know, say sorry about that and give you a better run. Uh, but yeah, only two of them, and then eventually only one made it out of that. Uh, which Dolph Ziggler, I mean, yes, they they made him a heavyweight champion, uh, but he's another one that uh, he's a, a great worker, uh, great on the mic, uh, but for some strange reason they will not push. I mean, they pushed him a couple times once to get him to the heavyweight belt, and then they paired him off with John Cena in like a Survivor Series type of match, um, where it was John Cena's team versus. Um, uh, I think it was the corporation's team. It was uh, Triple H's teams. Triple H and Stephanie McMahon, when they were doing the whole corporate uh, thing. Um, well, best for business. Yeah, what's best for business. And uh, what's funny about it is John Cena was eliminated from his team. And it got down to where it was just uh, Dolph Ziggler. Uh, and I think it was mainly all of the other team. And one by one, he was able to knock them all off. Uh, which was a great push. One, he was able to do something that John Cena couldn't do. But, like, right after that, they just dropped the ball on him again. Well, did I mean, he, he's still uh, there. Did he just not get engagement from the fans like Cena was doing? Oh, no. engagement? The, the fans liked him, too. Uh, yeah. And he was in his own little clique. But he's in that clique because um, he's in, like, The Miz. Uh, click. Uh, the Miz is another great worker. Uh, came from the real world, so he came from like the MTV, you know, world, uh, yeah. which everyone hated him when he first came out too, because they felt like he uh, uh, got a heads up in the business since he was already kind of famous. Well, um, I didn't think he deserved it when he first came in. So I'm one of those who well, didn't like him when he first came in. So a lot of people think that he went straight from the real world to WWE, but it wasn't like that. I have videotapes of him working independent uh, wrestling gigs in California, uh, and sometimes it was against very big guys that you think, hands down, would just wipe the, the room with him. Um, and uh, he, you know, he's a good wrestler. He, he knows what he's doing. Um, so I think he just got a bad shake, you know, from the beginning. Uh, did we already mention the Avatar? No, nope, but nope. he has been on mine. Yeah, so the Avatar. What a dumb I gimmick. have all props in the world for Al Snow. Uh, oh, that's Al not Snow was a great uh, person, uh, but he was the Avatar. And... Um, uh, very bad gimmick. It was a masked gimmick. Thank God it didn't last too long, but his next gimmick didn't even help him even. Uh, the, he was part of the new Rock and Roll Express. I uh, know the new rockers. Uh, so he took Shawn Michaels' spot. So it was him and Marty Jannetty. Uh, but even at that, uh, his name was like Cassidy something. Kind of like a, uh, like a ripoff of, uh, uh, Butch Cassidy, but uh, it was the Rockers gimmick um, that, asked, that actually lasted longer than it should. Uh, but both gimmicks were just horrible. Uh, you know, Shawn Michaels and Mario Gennetti, that was a tag team. Um, and to put anyone else with Mario Gennetti, uh, it was just not going to work. Um, That's the vast of the it four young. You're right. It was definitely a disaster. Uh, Mantar was the one I was thinking of, not Avatar. Yeah, Mantar. That was uh, half man, half centaur. Uh, Headbutt his opponent. Yeah, we call him yeah. Mantar because it was stupid. You know, if you looked at him before he was that character, he was a really big... Uh, imposing monster of a guy. Uh, and then he got this really shitty gimmick handed to him. <laughs> you know? And uh, it didn't last long. It was less than a year is what I've heard. Um, but, uh, you know, they had fake horns on the side of his head. Uh, um, 
you know, first he he would come out with a, like a like a head of a fucking buffalo uh, on him, kind of like uh, Big Van Vader, how he would come out with uh, that metal uh, helmet type thing that blows smoke when he hit the button and everything. But this was like a really bad fake buffalo head that he would put on and it had the horns. Um, but then he had to take it off to Russell because there's no way he would be so lopsided. Um, it was like back in the olden days, like in the 70s, there was a, uh, a guy who uh, would wrestle as uh, something moose, and he would literally uh, wear a moose head to the ring. And if you know, uh, a moose is not like the size of a deer. It's like um, mm-hmm. a size of a fucking truck. Uh, so the moose head is this big, big size too. And he came out full big old horns. Uh, and he would actually have to take it off, uh, before he got into the rope because he couldn't get between the ropes with the, the thing on his head. Um, but the crazy stuff, man. Uh, another one that I disagree with kiss demon. You know, that made that list, too. And even the guy who was talking about that list was like, uh, you know, it was a it was a good gimmick. Um, you know, this is back when WCW uh, did a thing with Kiss where Kiss would actually uh, do, like, a small concert at one of the Nitros where they would do one or two songs. Um, and so they inked this deal to be licensed to have this Kiss demon. Uh, he was dressed really cool. He knew how to wrestle. Um, he had a good look. Uh, so I don't know why. The complaint was just the um, concept that he was conjured through the music. I don't mind that. I liked his look and I liked his wrestling. And basically, they were mad that he was like a corporate puppet because he was like signed from Kiss. Uh, yeah. He was actually a wrestler, though, before he was the Kiss Demon. So it's not like he didn't pay his dues. He just yeah. got handed handed a gimmick, uh, I felt, that worked. Yeah. I mean, you were more of a WCW guy than I was. Uh, oh, I liked but it, though. Even when I, even when I watched it, I, I, I liked the gimmick. So I, think I, the story, I, I liked the storyline, too. Yeah. I mean, Kiss was known to be like this comical not comical but like a comic type of people you know i mean they had their own comics they had the whole whole kiss army um so i don't see why it it didn't work or why people didn't like it um one gimmick that i think worked was uh the one man gangs gimmick that twisted to the one man gang exactly how you would picture him like a big big guy biker gang you know his head was shaved on the sides he had like a mohawk uh he would have chains attached to him one man gang you know um and you know he was in wccw made it to wwf uh and then they decided that it wasn't getting over no more so he they uh, who was the Mr. Slick? Slick is was it Slick Rick was the manager? Slick was the uh, was I know it was part of this name. Uh, Slick discovered that the one man gang actually came from Africa uh, in a small little uh, hidden town, and so he renamed him Akim. And so Akim. Um, Talked like he was from Africa. Danced like, uh, well, didn't dance like he was from Africa, but danced like a white boy from Africa. Um, And uh, I, uh, you know, even though you know this did not exist, I I felt the gimmick worked. Uh, I think he did that jive just just to make it more of a comic relief, but... I, I feel that gimmick worked. What do, you, what do you think? Do you remember this gimmick? Very, very vaguely. But Not you were right about it being slick. 
Yeah, I know it's slick. But I don't know. I couldn't remember if they called him Slick Rick or if it was just slick. That's right. Uh, but uh, you know, so he uh, he teamed with uh, uh, Big Boss Man uh, for a while. It was him versus the Big Boss Man, and then they converted the Big Boss Man, so they were a tag team. Uh, a great match uh, that you can see on YouTube. Uh, I can't remember who. I think it was the Rockers uh, that they were facing. And both of them, the big boss man and Akeem, uh, hit the ropes at the same time, uh, the same side ropes. And uh, Akeem uh, flew into the, uh, flew out of the, <laughs> out of the ring because uh, big boss man, I guess, hit it just a little bit early to where he spread the ropes, <laughs> and Akeem just went right through. Uh, so yeah, it was like, it was pretty funny. That's a big guy. But I tell you, right, right. I, I tell you, I've met this guy. Um, again, Herb Simmons brings in the legends. Um, and a uh, very nice guy. Still a big guy. Uh, I mean, he's still tall. I think he lost a little bit of weight, but he was still pretty big. And yeah. he can still do his little his little jive that he was doing. Um, so a great guy. Uh, humbled to meet him. But uh, Keen uh, had made the list, um, but uh, I think it worked out. You mentioned Big uh, Boss Man. Uh, I got the Monty on my list. Feud with Big Boss Man. Well, the Monty wasn't the Big Boss Man. No, I said feud uh, with Big Boss Man. Oh yeah, he did feud with him. Uh, that was the uh, they were uh, Canadians. Uh, Rogue, Rogu, uh, like Rogue. Something brothers, um, I mean that's so uh, I, I can see it making the list, but in Canada that was a thing. So I guess it was on the list for being in the U.S. Uh, there was a thing that I read on here that said he was not allowed to perform it in certain parts of Canada, though. Because it was controversial. I mean, it could be. It could be because uh, technically that was uh, like a police of a police officer, uh, you know, in Canada. Just, just said it was so, controversial uh, character that Jackie's could not perform under the Mountie name when uh, held shows in Canada. Well, yeah, you, you do get yeah. that because uh, even in the United States, it's against the law to imposter a police officer or pose as a police officer. So I'm sure it's the same thing up in Canada. You know, because uh, the Monsies are police up there. So if you're going to, you know, pretend you're a police officer, I mean, you're going to get arrested like uh, like you pretended to be one. He became a Quebecer hey. and, you know, multiple tag team champion. He's fine. Speaking of Canada, I mean, we just had Friday Night Smackdown. We just had uh, the pay-per-view on Saturday. Um, I can't think of the name of it now. Elimination um, Chamber. Elimination Chamber. And then we had Monday Night Raw. All three uh, were in Canada. And uh, so looking at the – everyone's talking about the numbers. They haven't released the numbers. But evidently it just smashed all the numbers that Canada has ever produced. Um, and, you know, WWE has been to Canada every year. but they're saying that this storyline that they're dealing with right now with the bloodline and Sami Zayn and Cody Rhodes. Um, I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, I mean, it's a storyline that's brought me back to watching it. And so I'm only been watching it the last. And so not the whole, not even the whole storyline got me in bout. It's just hearing about the storyline made me want to watch it. And then actually sucked me in, and now I'm watching it. But, uh, you know, so we've seen Roman Reigns versus Sami Zayn this weekend. Uh, and I think they put on a hell of a match. Um, not the way it ended. Uh, I mean, the way it ended was not the way I wanted it to. Because uh, I was really hoping uh, that they would have split the belts, you know, Raw, SmackDown, so he can at least get one of them. Uh, and then Cody Rhodes eventually WrestleMania get the other one. Uh, not how it worked out. Uh, Roman Reigns won. Um, I liked 
uh, to interaction with uh, Sami Zayn's wife. Um, you know, she was on the Bobby. Did you see the match? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the interaction so like, that Roman had with his wife, with Sami Zayn's wife, uh, I think was great. Um, and, you know, even everyone talking about not WWE talking about, but all like the dirt sheets. All they were talking about how Roman was going to be by himself because the Usos could not go to Canada because of their DUI stuff that they have uh, down here in the States. Canada has a rule that if you have any felonies, you can't cross the border. I don't know what happened. Maybe the felonies got dropped. Maybe WWE paid a little extra, which they're known to do. Uh, but somehow the Usos were up in Canada, and, of course, they interfered. Both of them interfered in the match, uh, which was how it was probably a better surprise than the Royal Rumble ever was uh, because, according to the dirt sheets, th this was not going to happen. So when it happens, you know, that's the ultimate surprise. Uh, so both of them interfered, um, but, again, Roman won the match. But even after Roman won the match, um, oh, what's his name? Um, Kevin Owens. Yeah, Kevin Owens came out and uh, fucked up Roman for a little bit. Uh, so it, uh, it was a great storytelling. And, you know, they told it Friday going into Saturday. And then they told it a little bit more uh, Monday night as well. So uh, I'm sure it's going to carry on to this Friday. But, you know, uh, I haven't watched a WWE. I mean, there was one time last year that I watched it. Uh, and that's because we were in Vegas, and I was up in a hotel room for 10 minutes grabbing beer. Uh, and I just happened to watch a, a small segment, but then turned it off and went back downstairs. Um, other than that, yeah, literally that was the only time I watched it. And then just this buzz. And the, the reason why I'm saying Canada uh, – Nate is uh, Sami Zayn and uh, Kevin Owens are both Canadian, um, so that's why like the buzz and uh, the numbers for these uh, three shows uh, are saying they're saying there's through the roof. Uh, well, but, yeah, so, well, but, <laughs> yeah, I just want to throw that out there just because uh, you know it just happened. And it's actually got me to start watching uh, wrestling, uh, new wrestling again. Uh, so, again, side note, I always do it. Um, Tony Atlas, great guy. I've wrestled him, talked to him many of times. Uh, Tony Atlas was one that, uh, you know, left the WWF, um, not in a good way, um, but come back. He's been back and forth a couple times, uh, but one of the times they brought him back, and I think, I swear this is a punishment, because he was already up there as Tony Atlas before, but they brought him back as uh, Samba Simba, uh, and they dressed him up like he was from Africa. Uh, they dressed him up uh, like a fake little lion. They had like a, a thing that he wore around his head. Um, you know, they they talked, but he was a good guy. Uh, so they compared him to uh, uh, the Uganda Giant, uh, which I think was a great character. Um, but he was also a bad guy. But Tony Atlas' character was a good guy. Um, and, but it just, uh, for a guy who was a tag team champion, uh, Tony Atlas and Rocky Johnson, uh, going into uh, what did I say is it's Samba Simba. Uh, yeah, it was horrible. Stupid. It was definitely a punishment. I, I want to say. Um, let's see here. We talked about who. Uh, yeah, about. My list um, has Boogie Man, but that was another one I think worked. It, my list had Boogie Man too, and uh, I think it worked, and I think it still works. You know, and a great story about Boogeyman that not a lot of people know is he tried out for Tough Enough. 
I don't, I can't remember what season it was, but he tried that out. Two. Uh, it might have been, uh, but he was making it all the way to the end until they discovered that he lied about his age. Oh, because he, he was Marty Wright fourth season. Fourth season. So he lied about his age. He was actually older than what he put down. Because I want to say he was late 40s, maybe even early 50s uh, when he tried out. But the thing is, he was beating all of them. Uh, and you can tell that he looked like a wrestler. He looked in great shape. Uh, but they let him go uh, because he lied on his application. Um, but then uh, Booker T took him in because uh, Booker T down in Texas has his own organization, which he does funnel wrestlers up to the WWF uh, uh, E as well. Uh, but Booker T took him in and uh, trained him up. And then he came, eventually he came and uh, he was the boogeyman and he was great. Uh, he, uh, he's well known for eating worms. Uh, he would just pull them out of his pocket and guzzle them down. Um, or he, he, would add, or he, would, he would put them in other wrestlers' mouths. Sometimes he would put them in his mouth, chew them up, and spit them at the other guys. Um, I mean, I think it was a great character. And every now and then in a rumble, he'll pop up. Or if uh, one of the shows falls on Halloween, he'll pop up. Uh, so I think it's still a great character. Um, and the fans and still go crazy when they see him. That's why another reason why I say it worked. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, he was on my list. Um, another guy that I, I've been kind of getting to know, uh, Duke the Dumpster Drozzy. Uh, and he's a, he made the list just because he's a trash man. What, yeah, when, you think professional, when you think professional wrestler, you don't think trash man to be a, a great profession. Um, but he made it work, uh, and he made it work for a few years because uh, just talking him through, uh, through TikTok, uh, you know, if you guys want to reach out to him through TikTok, uh, he's, he's great. He'll answer you back, comment to you, uh, talk to you for a little bit. Uh, he knows I'm a wrestler. Uh, of course, everyone knows he's a wrestler. Uh, but, uh, he did this, he did this thing on TikTok cause he, he's, he's new to TikTok. Uh, and he did this, uh, picture. He posted this picture and one of those caption this, uh, and all I just let him have it. Uh, I mean, it was just great. Uh, it's like, uh, no one puts baby in the corner. Uh, uh, and then I, I said something about, um, uh, something about him, uh, being one, cause it was just him by himself and you can see all these other tables around him. And I was like, finally another wrestler at the level of Virgil, uh, you know, cause Virgil is well known, uh, to be, like, I mean, even though Virgil, God bless him, he's coming in May 13th, and I think it was a great gimmick that him and Million Dollar Man had. Uh, and I, I just going off of what I've seen on YouTube land and different other videos that I watched, uh, he's a guy that um, uh, will sell anything uh, on his table. So it doesn't even have to have his picture on it. Uh, Razor Ramon, before he passed away, Scott Hall, he called him out for selling pictures of, of him. <laughs> you know, so he wasn't even selling anything Virgil related. Um, but, uh, I heard, uh, uh, that he, uh, is not doing too well, uh, right now, but he's still coming in for us, uh, on May 13th. So God bless him. Cause, uh, I tell you. And uh, another guy that added uh, on, on the list, which I don't know why he added on the list, but um, uh, Dusty Rhodes uh, actually made it on the list because of his polka dot gimmick. Well, uh, he made that now, work, man. He made it work, and God bless him, he did. You know, Dusty Rhodes was everything in WCW. 
Uh, he was everything in the NWA. He was a two-time NWA champion. Uh, but when he came up, and he had been to WWF before, because he had wrestled uh, Bruno. Um, and he was, they, they even said that they were going to keep him uh, up there because he was getting just, a, uh, just the same amount of crowd support as Bruno was. Uh, and maybe it wasn't Bruno. Maybe it was um, uh, who was the guy that Hulk Hogan stole from? Uh, I don't know about Jesse that. Ventura. No, uh, close. Uh, they he dressed just like Jesse Ventura. Um, uh, God, wow. he always talked about his pythons before Hulk Hogan talked about his pythons. Um, I think he's the one that beat Bruno, uh, and then Bob Backlund beat him. Um, oh man, I can't think of his name because he, and he just recently had a GoFundMe, uh, come up because he's having really bad health issues. Um, and they thought, no you know, really huh? Superstar Billy Sorry. Green. Superstar Billy Graham. Uh, so I can't remember if it was Superstar or if it was uh, uh, the other gentleman. Uh, but when Dusty was up there, the fans were right behind him, and Dusty didn't have a belt. Uh, so they thought they were going to lock him down, but he left anyway and went back down to NWA. Um, but, yeah, so Superstar Billy Graham, that's, you know, uh, Vin uh, Jesse Ventura stole from him. Hulk Hogan stole from him. He was like the first coming of Hulk Hogan because uh, uh, he would always do his promos about his pythons, uh, and then Hogan stole that from him. Um, you know, he was the first one to wear the earrings and the do-rags um, and the colorful outfits, and then you got Jesse coming out from AWA and switching his shit into the same thing, and then, of course, Hogan followed behind uh, doing the same thing. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, the Virgil, Million Dollar Man, IRS versus Dusty Rhodes. Um, and then, uh, you know, when Dusty had uh, his manager, uh, it was a black lady. Uh, she's in the area, too. Yeah. Sapphire. Uh, so, Sapphire, believe it or not, and I told Herb this, Sapphire was the first autograph I ever had of wrestling. Uh, and it was uh, in St. Louis. Um, she lived in St. Louis. She was actually one of the girls from wrestling at the chase. Uh, she was in the audience. She was um, uh, one of the fans that became really close with all the wrestlers. And then Larry Manasek is the one that actually told Vince that he should uh, bring her up there as a wrestler because even Herb uh, had her as a wrestler. Uh, but she was the first one I ever got an autograph from. But that whole click there, um, that was awesome. You know, uh, that was right along the times that Hulk Hogan was really big in the 80s, too. I can tell Bobby's getting tired. It's already after midnight, so we're already going two hours. Uh, let me just, uh, yeah, let me just see. Uh, I think. Uh, I said the last one I, I got on my list. Along on mine. Looks like the last one I got on mine is the Goon. I do have the goon on here. Uh, the goon was just uh, uh, a hockey player that they made a pro wrestler become. Um, yeah, he's a guy that boy. didn't do well in WWE that they said would work great in independent wrestling. You know, it's kind of weird. Uh, it's kind of weird because some things work in independent. Uh, and won't work in the big show, and vice versa. Some things work up there, won't work in the independence. Uh, let me hit put, two. Like, uh, Bo Dallas into that category. NXT, right. when they were a little bit more independent, he was great down there. He was super over, and it did, just yeah. didn't work on the big stage. Yep. Uh, Dirty White Boy, uh, big Southern wrestler, was a heavyweight champion, Smoky Mountain. Uh, Russell for NWA, Russell for WCW. He came up uh, to uh, WWE. 
and he was T.L. Hopper, the wrestling plumber. And they said that the T.L. Hopper stood for Toilet Lid Hopper. Uh, really shitty character. <laughs> yeah. uh, pun intended. Uh, but the last one, I'm going to say, um, which is, is funny because um, I don't know if uh, you ever put connection to it, uh, you and your red hair, Bobby, uh, but the Red Rooster, um, Terry Taylor. Um, yeah. Terry Taylor was an awesome NWA wrestler, awesome WCW wrestler. I mean, he wasn't... Uh, he wasn't like a Lex Luger and big and famous, but as a, a wrestler, he was great. And uh, he went up to WWF or W yeah, WWF at the time. And they labeled him the red rooster. And uh, not all of his hair was red, just the stripe down the middle. So he still had the blonde on the sides. Uh, yeah, and yeah. You didn't pick up on it. I've been that, calling you Red Brewster, and you haven't picked up on it. Um, I've heard the reference. <laughs> but a uh, horrible gimmick for a great wrestler. Uh, I was telling Nate, I said, I got a story for you on this. Uh, and, and then we'll just call it a night because it's already over two hours. Um, so I'm working for TNA uh, Wrestling. They're doing a big pay-per-view uh in St. Charles. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm basically being a bodyguard for the wrestlers. Uh, it was a whole weekend thing. First night I'm a bodyguard in RVD, Rob Van Dam. And then, um, uh, I can't think of her name, but, uh, um, the guy from, uh, uh, what the hell is his name? Richard from uh, South Broadway, not uh, Glory Pro. Richard, what's his, uh, his, his name? You're talking Velvet Sky, though, his his wife. Yeah, it was his wife. It wasn't Velvet Sky, but it was it's one of the beautiful her, her people is what you're called. Uh, uh, yeah, her so I, uh, body, yeah, I bodyguard for her for a while. Uh, and then the second day was Hulk Hogan. So I was with Hulk Hogan for that whole day. And it was it was great. It was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sunday was the pay-per-view. And, you know, so the, the ones that worked uh, the shows, um, we got to meet everyone. And uh, I was talking to, uh, I think, Angelina I want to say, Love. Angelina Love, yes. Um so I was I was talking to one of the wrestlers, and uh, I can't remember who it was, but uh, he uh, he see my badge, and he goes, "You want me to sign your badge?" And I looked over behind him. I said, "I would love to, but I want to see if he would sign it." And it was Terry uh, Terry, uh, Terry Taylor, and he was just a backstage guy at this point. And he was shocked as shit that I didn't even know who he was. Uh, and I said, I mean, you were a great wrestler. Uh, I would love uh, for you to sign this. And so my badge that I have is signed by Terry, Terry Taylor. But I want to say the other guy was AJ Styles, uh, which I got his autograph on it as well, because AJ is a phenomenal wrestler. Um, but they were both, they were kind of both shocked that I really wanted uh, Terry Taylor's autograph. Uh, but, yeah, so it, it was just a, a, ca a casual conversation between me and the guy, and I just happened to look behind and see Terry. And growing up watching Terry wrestle in WCW slash NWA, I was like, uh, I, I want his autograph. <laughs> you know, so. But that's it. That's, that's the list. I'm sure other people will have different names. Um, you know, and some people might agree or disagree with us, uh, but um, you know, Nate not being a, a, a diehard wrestling fan, he was like, "I got this idea for a show tonight. Uh, let's talk about best and worst gimmicks, or worst gimmicks that either could have made it or didn't make it, or just fell out, you know, flat." Uh, so I was like, "Well, you know, that's a cool idea." Yeah. So, uh, 
Um, again, it's over two hours. We're all tired. We're all beat to hell. Um, so I would like to say um, when you see this video, even if it's on Facebook land or if it's on Twitter uh, or even on YouTube, guys, if you see it on Facebook and you just like the Facebook, we don't see that. You actually got to click on it. You know, watch it. It's great. Um, you know, I think we're doing good, but we'd we'll love to have your opinion. But you have to leave it on the YouTube channel. Uh, so liking it on Facebook does not help us out at all. Click on it. Tell us if you hate us. Tell us if you like us. Subscribe. <coughs> Do that for us so we know we're doing a good job. Because uh, I'll tell you, I'll be honest, uh, you know, Nate does a good job of the editing, and he does small little clips that does 700 views. But the actual YouTube of us actually talking about the small clips in a bigger setting, you know, we might get 41, 45. It's a big difference between 45 and 700. So definitely... Even on Facebook land, or we all post it on Twitters, uh, on our accounts, look in it, leave us a comment, subscribe if you feel like we're doing great. Tell us to F off if we're not doing great. At least you can put it in the comment section, we'll at least know it. Um, but um, I just wanted to get that out before I sailed off. Um, you guys got right, anything else? Fred. Like, subscribe, don't forget, March 11th, everybody needs to show up. We need to sell it out again, standing room only. Come on, people. Absolutely. That is correct. It'll be my night of revenge. Uh, uh, I'll just say, you know, me and Gary are going to go back for our belts. Uh, the ref uh, and Attila pretty much and uh, their manager screwed us around this last time. Uh, even Gary, who was not the legal man, got pinned. So I don't know how that worked. Uh, but well, what uh, I have to do is watch your shorts. Go to our Instagram page. The short on YouTube will be coming out here shortly. It's on. It's scheduled. And you can see. And them twice. There you go. So if anything, come March 11th. Come down to uh, the Belclair Fairgrounds. Uh, you know, if you run into Nate, he would love to get you on film. Love to get you to interview. Love to talk, have you talk about who your favorite wrestler is. <coughs> and, be and, Bobby watch, and, uh, Big Texan. and then you can watch uh, Bobby defend his belts and, and win. And then you can watch uh, me and uh, Gary Jackson uh, take back our titles. So I will not be there that night. Oh, never mind. Just come and watch uh, Big Texan and I'll Gary see. Jackson then. I'll be watching online cheering you on, though. That is supposed to be there when I fucking stayed up in Champagne. So, ah, well, you gotta uh, the little devils. You gotta support those guys, yep. uh, which we're coming back to the little devils field and having a show too. So uh, that will be happening soon. So we'll we'll uh, start promoting that when it gets a little closer. But uh, I guess for tonight, um, I'll see you later. Adios. Yes. All right. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.